Hey everyone, welcome back to the Sports Psych Show. Thanks so much for joining me. Today I'm really excited to welcome sport and performance psychologist Dr. Brandon Orr onto the show. Brandon, great to have you on. Yeah, absolutely. Been looking forward to this. Uh, we've run in some intersections in different spots and, and I'm, I'm pumped to be on board with you. Mainly on Clubhouse. Yeah. The, um, yeah. Sort of, I, I don't know if it's still going. I assume it is the social media platform that everybody was using, certainly during lockdown. And yeah. you would join Dr. Scott Goldman and uh, Dr. Chris Shambrook and uh, myself. Yeah. And yeah. It was awesome when it was going. That, that was yeah. some just vibrant discussion. I was sad to see it go away. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it was um, it was brilliant while it lasted. We have to, we mm. had some really fantastic conversations, and and you made some incredible contributions. So uh, we've been trying to fix this up for a long time, and I'm super excited mm-hmm. to have you on. Um, hopefully, that's teased the audience in terms mm-hmm. of uh, listening in and and staying tuned. So, with that in mind, would you mind introducing yourself to to the Sports Psych Show audience? Absolutely. Yeah. Classically trained, um, sport and performance psychology with an emphasis on the, the performance enhancement side, uh, more so than the, the clinical uh, well-being, mental health uh, component. And, and for me, my background was in college coaching. And this whole almost detour, <laughs> if you will, off of that first identified purpose and, and mission was I had a student athlete. He was the number one recruit uh, in the country for us. Um, He was talented beyond anybody I had ever worked with. As a true freshman, he could be in that lone defensive back position and just play one-on-one football and let everybody else do their part. But I've got this guy, and that's rare. Um, And, you know, the, the, the difficulty of it was, he was motivated and interested more in Grey Goose and in marijuana than he was the NFL and being an All-American. And I took that personal. Uh, I've always taken that kind of personal ownership component to, uh, you know, for lack of a better term, fix uh, the problem. Right. Yeah. Um, so that summer, that was his freshman year. We saw some really bad behaviors coming in in the winter and the spring. So I spent that summer before training camp in Barnes and Noble, just pouring into anything in the sports psych section I could find, you know, Google in in these online libraries that we have at our luxury now was not what it is. And that was the only avenue that I knew was to go to Barnes and Noble and read as many sports psych things as I could to quote unquote, try and fix this, this lad. (laughs) And That was a failed endeavor, but the beauty of it was that I have since been fascinated with the the psychological universe that accompanies uh, performance. So when I made the decision to get out of coaching, logical progression was a PhD in sports psychology and was able to train under uh, Rick McGuire at the University of Missouri, which is a counseling psychology based program with a sub emphasis in sports psych. And upon graduation, we had this idea of, look, I I certainly felt unweaponized to deal with the psychological component of performance. And if I felt this way, then most certainly there are other coaches that feel this way. So let's build a online uh, master's in education that is solely based on coaching psychology. So we took principles from sports psychology, performance psychology, coaching psychology, and positive psychology. And we uh, blended them uh, into a curriculum that was focused on coaching the coaches. And at the same time, simultaneously working with um, University of Missouri Athletics and doing work with various programs and doc students underneath me doing their own uh, in the field work. And that led to another uh, fascination and obsession with resilience uh, as a theoretical and and conceptual 
framework and how we could run that out with particular teams at Mizzou. And that uh, is what led to another uh, career trajectory into where I sit now with uh, U.S. Special Operations because the uh, assessment and selection side of that sector I was very intrigued by the ability to enhance uh, resilience, given how difficult their training and their assessment selection uh, pipeline is. There's a lot to unpack there. Awesome. I'm looking forward to this. And and we come from quite similar backgrounds in terms of Mm -hmm. both psychologists, but with a coaching background. Like we came to psychology, I was a golf coach listen to you i didn't see Mm -hmm. i didn't realize you came from a coach i didn't realize you were a football was in uh america please excuse me for saying this american american football background completely (laughs) understand the reference i lived in spain for a couple of years oh i understand the delineation (laughs) it's football right soccer soccer football football is football We'll, we'll, we'll go with that and um do you think because obviously you know i'd i'd love to talk more about and unpack the special op staff and whilst being respectful about what mm-hmm. you can and can't talk about but um going back to your your college days as a, as a coach do you think that experience has shaped your viewpoint of sports psychology i mean you kind of said it basically has because that's where it started but um, do you do you think? I mean, you would have sat down and listened to a lot of sports psychologists probably speak, whether on podcasts, whether on stage. Do you think that your coaching background has led to you seeing sports psych- yeah. slightly differently to 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 somebody who doesn't come from that coaching background? I feel like it's given me a more profound lens to look at problem solving. And, you know, there's a piece out of uh, Glazier's unified theory, the gut model, and it's looking at a holistic, comprehensive, integrative system for uh, human performance development. And he's got a really nice nugget in there where he says, rarely is a complex problem ever solved through a single discipline of study. And that is the piece that whether it was through college football or through my affiliation with Mizzou wrestling, rarely is it just physical, psychological, physiological, or social, right? It's all of them in one. So it never rested well with me, this whole 80-20, you know, golf is 80% mental and 20% physical. Like, no, not at all. Yeah. You know, special operations is 90% mental and 10% physical. No, no, it's not. It's a hundred percent physical, a hundred percent psychological, a hundred percent physiological and a hundred percent social. All of those pieces come together in this beautiful yet massively complicated intersection to produce performance. So that's a piece that has carried forward from sport because if I look at it, like certain offensive sets present really difficult problems for a defense. And if you focus on this side of the formation, then you leave yourself vulnerable on the other side of the formation. If you focus solely on pass defense, then you leave yourself vulnerable to run defense. So when we're case conceptualizing, it's don't forsake physiology and the physiological element that is involved in wrestling. Don't think that that young man is breaking in the third period because he's mentally weak. It could very well be an aerobic versus the anaerobic imbalance. So that's, that's been a big piece. And the other one, and I think that this is just a local bias of where I studied and the intersections that I was with within that department where there was a strong tone of trying to de-emphasize winning for the purpose of holistic well-being. And I knew that that piece was never going to resonate with coaches 
and that at the upper echelon of our athletes was not going to resonate. That it doesn't have to be that well-being and high performance, otherwise known as winning, have to be bifurcated. It isn't that one you know, has to be toggled up or toggled down in support of the other. I think when we got into our positive psychology research, we started to see that they both inform each other positively or negatively on a very kind of linear correlation. And those are two pieces that I would have never have had the appreciation for if I wasn't first a coach. There's two things I'm hearing there. Firstly, your broad lens for solutions, taking mm-hmm. a holistic approach, understand it all, t- taking a holistic approach and being ready to fit into a multi dimensional team where everybody can contribute and trying to join up the dots between, as you've said, whether it's the psychological, the technical, the biomechanical, the physiological, the tactical, it's it's all thrown in. Mm-hmm. Um, and the other thing I, I hear is taking a, uh, a broader lens again, another broad lens, a broader lens across psychology. It's interesting. The curriculum that you cultivated was one, as you said, performance psychology, coaching psychology, um, positive psychology. I I think you mentioned a few other psychologies, if that's how you want to describe them. But what I love about that, I'm biased because I see this in the same way as I'm greedy to define psychology broadly. And I do wonder if we're becoming a bit guilty in sports psychology Mm -hmm. of um, moving towards sort of unidimensional approaches around sort of it's just about mental health it's just about well-being these are the meat on the bones so well let's be a bit greedy here it's performance yes. and well-being performance and mental health yeah. development you know yeah. learning and development and player engagement and person engagement and well-being and welfare and in servitude to winning yes yeah and then it gets a lot more complex and, yeah. and a lot more is asked from each individual agent when that's our lens. And so that interests me because here, here, here's this juxtaposition. You come from a coaching background and you feel that that coaching background has given you this broader lens, broader perspective. And yet, do you actually find or have you historically found coaches who struggle with that broad lens who, who, who struggle to look at things multi-dimensionally yeah perfect perfect example um uh, there was a country that i was working with prior to the 2016 olympics mm. and they had a very talented but kind of prodigious wrestler who was young and was successful on the world stage, but not at the Olympic stage and would have to, if he was going to win gold, would most likely have to take down a three-time Olympic champ at his weight class. So what was their prescription for that problem set? Their prescription for that problem set was to bring in as a training partner an Olympic champion who then would just crush this young man in his individual sessions. And I sat and I watched him in a scenario of a live takedown session, first one to 10 takedowns wins. And you saw, first of all, he never scored a takedown himself. And at about the fourth or fifth takedown, he was completely shut down. Hmm. There was no output on his part. He's in the devastating state that I I call learned helplessness. No effort on my behalf is going to impact this outcome. And what was the coach's solution 
coming out of that session. Um, they verbally and physically abused him. They called him a, a number of terms that all pointed towards mental weakness. And they simply said, we're going to keep doing this drill until you get tough. That forsakes perceived competence. That forsakes self-efficacy. That forsakes physiological training and whether or not he has, again, that aerobic anaerobic base to be able to hold that type of output. It forsakes modeling and whether or not he perceives his competence against that individual in a contextual lens, that, that's massively different. To have a strong assessment, a positive assessment of one's self-efficacy in training versus competition, well, Harwood has spoken profoundly to that. It's another thing against, say, the top 32 in the world to have a strong, positive assessment of one's self-efficacy and it's a whole nother thing against the top one or two in the world. And all of that comes into context. And so we forsake a litany of domains of context when we become unilateral and unidimensional. Forsake and inflate. Inflate the impact this so-called desired toughness in inverted commas can have on performance. That if I, if this person is tough, tougher, then that will develop a competence that can match the competence, let's say, of the best in the world. Mm -hmm. So it forsakes, forsakes and inflates. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it opened up for me a space that I found really critical, both in sport and the, the tactical domain, and that's the delineation, the, the specificity between belief and confidence in the way in which like a process orientation and a mastery achievement orientation has a very strong intersection with belief because I can take domains from a process orientation and I can have attributional beliefs about my persistence, determination, learning, skill acquisition, skill adaptation, so on and so forth. But relative to confidence, and, and again, that, that left quadrant that we just talked about, that's completely inoculated from outcome because that is just process and commitment and challenge. But when we operate in this confidence domain, well, what does it take to be confident? Largely, it takes theoretically and conceptually off the definition, it takes a positive outcome to be confident in one's ability to hit a putt with the match on the line. It takes confidence about metabolizing and digesting stress to hit a key putt. We have to have done it before in order to have some positive evaluation of that context. That has been a really integral influence in the work that, that I've done in, in helping people set up this opposing spectrum between belief and confidence, process and outcome. Past experiences build self-belief, which in terms builds confidence. Is that what you're saying to me? Probably for me, put it in more inflammatory language, the danger of confidence is that it requires past positive outcomes. Okay. So you wouldn't necessarily talk to an athlete about confidence or developing confidence unless that athlete came to you to talk about confidence? Yeah, I would more go about steering the discussion towards elements of belief <laughs> and what about their commitment and training outcomes right. yields them a belief about their ability to produce the desired and valued outcome. 
And once we get there, you know, we've got now, you know, we've got a, a target of opportunity. We've got a course of action. We've got an identified path of the things that we need to develop to give us the best chance for that desired outcome. And when we hit that, confidence in any one of those areas can increase. But because confidence is a byproduct, I'm more inclined to keep myself in that domain of belief, self-efficacy, and self-agency. Confidence fits onto the end of the, of the equation. Yes. Self-belief or a belief is in amongst the middle of the equation mixed in with process and mastery belief as, as a consequence of many mastery moments yeah, and yeah. the successful execution of processes. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm 100% with you there. And so you mentioned earlier that as a sports psychologist, that you you have no problem that in, in terms of the in terms of complexity across a continuum of task to outcome process to outcome we can in psychology and i am absolutely guilty of this guilty is possibly the wrong word because i do wonder if sometimes as a broad brush statement we are socialized in coaching and playing into an outcome orientation and into performance outcomes and communication tends to reside there. Mm -hmm. So a lot of my work I found historically has been guiding people back to let's say task and mastery. But I certainly agree with you. We can still have a language around outcome. We can still work in servitude towards outcome. But how does that how does that work for you? Because other than sort of saying, well, there's, some, there's a sweet spot there. There's a sweet spot in your communication. And, or we can incorporate outcome goals into your task and your mastery goals. And your, you know, if you're engaging in that kind of process with a, with a player and your performance goals. Is that how you're doing that? Is how, that how you're creating a balance there or, and bringing outcome into it? Or are there other ways? I, get, I think it comes into like locus of control. Yep. Right. And understanding for a wrestling match, hmm. what are the elements of the process that you need to have physical prowess and physical superordinance over your opponent in order to produce the valued outcome? Hmm. Well, I need to have superior prowess in hand fighting, superior prowess in positioning, superior prowess in setup, superior prowess in leg attack, superior prowess in finishing my attack, superior prowess in the top uh, position and scoring points from the top position. And should the tables turn, superior prowess from the bottom position in getting out. So within each of those, we can identify deficiencies, we can identify proficiencies, and we can build a, a plan of attack within each of those elements that then increases, obviously, agency. It increases self-efficacy because they can see themselves getting better they can see themselves evolving within that evolution. There's always this loop of proficiency and deficiency that we're constantly attacking. And that is in support of the end goal, the end outcome of winning. Whether that's individual or team, uh, that, that's always been the, the framework that I've adopted. You're thickening the language around process, task, mastery, in servitude of outcome, but thinning maybe the language around outcome, lessening yeah. it, make, helping yeah. it to dissipate within the environment. Yeah, 
because, you know, ultimately if we're operating from a mantra, it's the process dictates the outcome. And that doesn't in any way dilute the severity or the necessity of the outcome. We understand that the central constitution of sport is for an individual or a group of individuals to come in and demonstrate psychological and physical prowess over another. That's how a winner is identified. So that's not in any way uh, diluted. We understand that that is the normative criterion for success. And the question is then with where we are today versus where we need to be or where we want to be tomorrow, what areas relative to that process should I engage in? So when you were working with international wrestlers, a big part of your job was within the development domain, developing towards competition and then in the performance domain within competition. Would I be right in saying that? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Because we know, again, to, to, to hearken in on what Harwood discovered, we know that the most task-oriented, mastery-oriented individual can become outcome and ego-oriented in competition. So take a person that is task-oriented in training and then change the stem of the TOSC assessment to competition instead of this global, you know, in general, I'm task oriented. We'll change that stem to competition and then look at how the scores on the assessment change. And what the research shows is that a person who is globally oriented towards task and mastery in the context put that in bold in the context of competition, their motivational orientation shifts yep. to ego orientation, winning outcome, you know, fill in the blank with, with any other nomenclature from an outcome standpoint. Did you ever have any wrestler say, Hey doc, Hey Brandon, I hear what you're saying, but you know what, when I get out there, I've just got to think that I'm going to annihilate this person. And that's the most important thing. For yeah. Me. Yeah, absolutely. Some of the, some of the best individuals don't resonate at all uh, with that discussion. And, and, and it's really, you know, we're all dealing in competency hierarchies, right? Um, the spectrum between I'm stepping up to take this PK and there is no doubt in my mind whatsoever that it's going to go top right, that he's not going to have a chance to stop it, and that there is 0% chance that I am not going to hit it. As opposed to the lesser end of the spectrum of there's a lot of nerves and anxiety and mystery that is accompanying me on this journey to this ball and I'm going to plant and I'm going to kick and I hope it goes in. <laughs> so there are those individuals, man, where a hundred percent, they step up to the X with no doubt whatsoever. And their, their joy, their currency in performing is the moment of imposing their will on the moment or the opponent. I'm interested just dwelling on the wrestling a little bit. And I suppose we could interchange combat sports here, fighting sports, interchange wrestling with boxing, with MMA. Did you find with the wrestlers that most of them performed at what we in psychology would use the term, you know, arousal levels, um, mm -hmm. activation levels? Mm -hmm. that they would perform at a high activation, very high activation level. You know, that classic, almost cliched scale of one to 10, you know, they're sort of up at eight. Well, there's some wrestlers who were more, who might be a little bit lower on that scale, perhaps more thoughtful, perhaps um, 
more technically oriented, more 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 looking to outwit opponent their opponent rather than to outmuscle. And I think you see that a lot in the combatives domain. Okay. Uh, the individual whose tactic and strategy is to use the energy of their opponent against them. Okay. And so their offense is to play defensively. And so they're the, the counter striker, right? They're letting that guy expose himself and then parlaying it and hitting them with an uppercut or parlaying it into an ankle lock off of their shot, right? So their, their offense is ultimately from a defensive position. And I absolutely have recognized that that's the space where they best make sense of how to perform. And, and you certainly see that degrees of freedom in combat sports of which wrestling uh, is included. The most for me of any of the intersections that I've been in. How would that relate to football? I guess it would ultimately kind of hinge on the on the coach and what type of scheme uh, they're trying to uh, utilize and mobilize within for a given game. You know, if you understand that if we try to just play a, a, a shell defense and keep everything in front of us that they are in fact skilled enough to march right down the field <laughs> one play after the next and put a score on you and understanding that we don't have enough talent to just match up 11 to 11 and it becomes an, a game of analytics that on third down from this formation, their tendency is 37% of the time to go to this zone or this area or this player. And rather than us just kind of passively trying to keep everything in front of us, it's incorporating blitzes and disguises that are kind of pointed right at that player or right at that scheme to take that best part away and force them to win the game through other means. So while it's less kind of, you know, personnel oriented, it's more uh, schematic and, and mm -hmm. tactical orientation from a coaching standpoint. Well, I was going to ask you about that college football NFL. And I appreciate you, you coached at college, the college level. Um, as a, uh, I suppose, I'm going to be a bit guilty of asking you to bring up broad brush statements here, so 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 please excuse me. But college football, NFL, mm -hmm. data rich. Are they psychology rich across college uh, football across NFL? Well, it depends on which domain we want to talk about. I think the nature of collegiate and professional athletics, football in particular, there's been an implore that the mental health well-being side be tended to. So are they psychology rich there? Yes, 100%. With some really good intended and, and well run out initiatives that every team will have a mental health provider, right? That every department will have a psychological department in tandem with the medical team uh, providing services in that domain. Are they applied psych rich? The top end? Yes. The, the two best teams by and large in college football 
Alabama and Georgia have obviously the mental health well-being component honed in on. But where they are exceptional is in the applied space where they are also intentional about mental performance and providing services and coaches uh, in that domain. And therein, it's not surprising in any way that they've been the two dominant teams because they are the two teams that are outright and vocal about what they do to coach the psychological tactics as well as the physical tactics. Do you know the kind of stuff that they do? I think from a pedestrian standpoint, yeah. Yeah, I think Nick Saban and Kirby Smart have been very uh, vocal uh, about the the elements that they do um, with a lot of motivational interviewing and from resilience, the, the social capital, the team cohesion component in terms of role identifiability, role acceptance, role execution. I think those are the spaces uh, that they've been very aggressive in. The deep down and in tactics, um, I don't know that they publicize those as much, rightfully so. Of course. (laughs) Yeah. But it's interesting that the the words that you use there, and they're obvious words, but they're, they're words that catch my ear. They know what they 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 know what they're doing. They have something to do. They you know they're they're the motivational interview. They're using motivational interviewing um, as an example. Strikes me across sports, and I, I do sometimes wonder if we can be guilty here in the UK. Um, that plans a bio psychosocial plan isn't always in place in a team in a club in an organization in a program and listening to what you're Mm -hmm. saying obviously you're you're not in those programs so you can't give any detail but they perhaps they have a tangible plan that gives them something to do on the motivational piece here this is what we do on the team cohesion piece here, this is what yes. we do. And there's going to be some join, joined up solutions yes. there, but this is what we do. Yeah. There's a plan. And I, I would say, too, like especially to the mm. social piece, which I appreciate the way your content of late has highlighted that element, because all too often – We've talked about this in in the clubhouse space where the the social piece is so misunderstood, you know, in terms of task cohesion, social cohesion, the way that that's moderated by gender, the way that the intra-gender component works with a male head coach and female athletes and all the profundity that, that comes in there. All too often, the approach per se is interpersonal integration, likability, likeness, and that from there, task cohesion will flow. And the research is just very clear that that is not in any way true. And then you look at the language that Bama football players use relative to doing their job, uh, the Bama way, the Bama culture, you now are starting to hear that uh, Georgia uh, as well. And it's so powerful because there's a way of doing things relative to being a fullback or a defender or a center fielder, right? But then there's the Manchester way, the Arsenal way, the Barca way, you know, the Bama way, Georgia way. Like those are those shared norms that I think you have to spend your time there saying not only what is your job, how are you expected to do your job? And now there's standards of excellence that help filter everybody's role and everybody's role execution. That's the powerful piece of cohesion, not whether or not you want to eat with that person in the defect. 
<laughs> so, hearing several things there that when we talk about cohesion, we tend to orient towards the social cohesion piece, missing the task cohesion piece. Um, the XX way, the Manchester way, the Arsenal way, the, the Bama way, etc. is, well, at Alabama, at Georgia, that's just more than a statement. And it's possibly more mm -hmm. than just a statement that possibly vaguely resembles something that we've done historically. There are plans underneath, underneath the Alabama way, the Georgia way, related to what I do as an individual, what I do as a teammate, around social cohesion, around task cohesion, and other topics, motivation, etc., etc. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think some of the kind of fascinating components of this are then the way the field informs the classroom and the field informs social citizenry so that can we have an extension of the way we do things at X franchise or X program and have that advance from the field, from the training environment to the academic environment, and again, the social citizen environment. Those are the pieces where you start building out that profundity to your shared norms. You're now working, let's just change tack a little bit, you're now working with the American military special operations Um and again, as I mentioned at the beginning of a program, can be very respectful about what you can and, and can't talk about because whenever I think of military, I think of top secret stuff. So, <laughs> yeah, right. but it fascinates me. I mean, historically, I've done bits and bobs here in, in England militarily. Um, it's a performance domain, which I think is fascinating, not least because in sports psychology, we talk, we talk about getting rid of uh, mm -hmm. extreme language uh, related to bad performances, but literally in the military, if you had a bad performance, it can be quite extreme. It can be life and death. Yeah. So um, that's one that yeah. is 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 always important to think about. How did you end up in working uh, for the military, if you don't mind me asking? Right. We were deep diving into resilience when I was at Mizzou. I had a team of six doc students and about 15 master students. Mm. And I was approached by uh, the head coach of a team that was nationally prolific, which in that given sport would be say on an annual basis, top 10 um, on a pretty frequent basis, top five. Mm. And he was looking at his athletes knowing there's a really strong likelihood that they're going to be in contention for a national championship and that, that in that given sport, that the mental component is crucial. So would you be willing to build out a resilience program for us that we start in the off season and then carry through in ever-evolving iterations throughout the season and into the championship season. So we started that in uh, 2014 and ran that out again for uh, about five years. And we started with the theoretical framework of resilience and Fletcher and Sarkar and yep. all of the kind of meta-analysis of like, what do we – what do we have in terms of the best practices on, on resilience? And then from our framework, as we built it out, looking at what elements conceptually, theoretically apply to this sport, what we then did was we started to work in line with the coaching staff to build active learning 
sessions where instead of talking about approach versus avoidance motivation and doing an approach versus avoidance motivation PowerPoint, let's build an activity that's centered on the principle of approach versus avoidance. Give them live reps of creating a headspace that's around approach and challenge and taking reps live building an awareness about their psychological universe, the things that happen in these scenarios, and then doing a deep debrief afterwards of what was your lived experience, do some normalization within teammates of things that they experienced, things that they didn't experience, strategies they employed versus I like that strategy, I'm going to apply that the next time, and just seeing how much value added that program could be and that became uh, very popular with one of the strength and conditioning coaches who at that time was being recruited by uh, Air Force Special Operations. And um, they have a huge attrition problem in that pipeline. It is a brutal, rigorous, arduous pipeline that is very water heavy. And we understand the way water psychologically and physiologically can impose its will on an individual trying to perform within it. So they uh, recruited me to come out and, and build out a resilience program for them to embed into their assessment and selection environment and to be a performance coach and a performance kind of mentor, if you will, that was teaching in an academic setting, but also embedded with them in the training environment uh, helping them to understand, identify, and express behavioral resilience in a deep stress environment. Before we explore that a little bit, can we just take a step back? I think it's really interesting. You went into this sports program to um, deliver a resilience program you alluded to the work of David Fletcher and Mustafa Selka. Mus has been on the show talking to us about individual resilience and team resilience and organizational resilience that he's been doing more mm -hmm. latterly. But you use these two words, approach and avoidance. Approach and avoidance. I'm just mm -hmm. mindful of people listening and go, okay, well, sounds great. What's approach and avoidance? So could you give us a, a sort of a brief description of what that definition, what, what approach and avoidance are? Yeah, I think it's the way in which you apply your motivational language to a given circumstance or condition. Okay. So if we look at it in sport, we could easily look at third down for a wide receiver and the motivational language being, I just don't want to drop this pass. Okay, well, that's, that's an avoidance of a, an undesired or um, detrimental outcome as opposed to approach being this is a massive opportunity. I am excited by this opportunity. I understand it's going to be important to locate the ball as quickly as possible, to look it into my eyes completely from ball to touching hand to getting a clean release. Like there's all of these pieces now that look at this moment as a moment of opportunity that there, instead of it being a threat for an undesired outcome, there is a curiosity about a potential positive outcome and channeling my physical and cognitive energy towards executing in such a way that gives that outcome the greatest likelihood of being expressed. That's the way in which I conceptualize approach versus avoidance language and the way it would inform the headspace of a performer prior to a critical moment. And I love what you've said there, physical energy, mm. because 
approach and avoidance to approach. So as you said, it could be cognitive, it could be linguistic, it could be as a golfer, don't you know, don't hit it right, don't hit it left, don't hit it in the water. Sure. That was always me, Brandon. Sure. Sure. Don't hit it left. I'm with you. Okay. Rather than there's the ferry, hit the ferry. Yeah. Hit the fairway. So I, I, I can think it, I can picture it, I can linguistically state it. But there's something about that physical sense. I mean, this is to me heavily oriented towards the work of an incredible English psychologist in the 20th century. Um, he was based in Camberwell in London called Geoffrey Gray, who, who essentially devised the biopsychological theory of personality, which investigated these two brain uh, processes, uh, the behavioral act activation system or activating system and the uh, behavioral inhibition system. Activation, inhibition, activation being to work towards, to approach, inhibition to work away from, um, to, uh, to avoid. Um, and I, I'm saying this because I think it is it it's evolutionary it's it's animalistic it's in it's whether one calls it the deepest parts of our brain or our nervous system it's that physical self it's to physically move towards or physically move away from even if we're not physically doing it it's kind of it's almost physical it's a I always call it a positive intent you know it's I've got a positive intent moving towards rather than moving away from a negative intent if you like or no intent yeah. at all yeah um, yeah, no question. Just a thought. Well, but there's there's a really powerful part that you're speaking to that then has been magnified for me in the tactical realm okay. of stepping up to the plate, stepping up to the PK, stepping up to the line on third down. And having your psychological universe become, I just don't want to strike out. I just don't want to push this ball. I don't want to push this putt. I don't want to drop this ball, right? Okay, so we understand in critical moments, especially under deep stress, that can be the kind of autonomic nervous system's yep. response yep. to that stress and whatever that stress might be. Okay. Well take now uh, maritime training, you know, where you're doing underwater activities on a single breath hold where you have carbon dioxide tolerance, carbon dioxide, digestion, hypoxia, massive, massive sympathetic nervous system responses. Well, okay. What can then be the psychological universe response to that? I hate this feeling. I hate the feeling of the pressure in my chest cavity increasing. I hate the feeling of gupping in my spleen, pushing red blood and, and my sympathetic nervous system demanding that I take a breath. I hate that feeling. And in fact, because I am so avoidantly motivated and emotionally driven in my behavioral responses, I will do whatever it takes to make that unpleasant, unwanted feeling dissipate as quickly as possible. So I will bail on this event. And that is another kind of subset of approach versus avoidance motivation. And I love what you're talking about in terms of activation and inhibition, right? Well, in that space, you have better have yourself primed to express strong inhibitory function to resist that impulse to take a breath, to breathe off the snorkel, to surface prematurely, um, to look at the defender, right? Or um, to swing carelessly, whatever it, it, yeah. it might be. When any piece in terms of activation that is driven towards successfully executing that task, the brain's not going to leave you alone to do that. So whether it's a, a monkey <laughs> that, that lives up there or, you know, it's chaos language, whatever it might be, we had better have a pretty strong inhibitory function to resist impulse and direct ourselves in a task-directed focus towards the pieces of 
you know, behavioral activation in line with the optimal execution of whatever that prescribed task is. So what interests me then is that I think most people listening in can get when this college coach calls you in, they want to win the championship. They just need some frameworks there. They need to work on their resilience. So you're working on creating, helping that coach create activities that tap avoidance, that help players start to communicate about and practice approach behaviors, approach cognitions, approach affect, feeling, emotions, right? And I I would imagine the general consensus would be what, what in the army, soldiers, special ops soldiers need to train this. Surely they're the people who just go into any kind of situation, the kind of situations that you eloquently spoke about that sound somewhat scary, right? Um, Mm -hmm. That they would just have a natural affiliation with approach, that they would be able to sustain what they're doing irrespective of their bodily function screaming at them, that they would naturally inherently display resilience because or engage with um, moments of resilience, as Mustafa Saka would say, um, because look, they're, they're, they're soldiers. But I'm guessing you're going to say that's not the case. We've got to continue to train these soldiers to be able to to keep engaging in approach behavior. Yeah, yeah, it's it's not that the emotions that we're talking about don't accompany them in performance. Mm. They're human. Just because yep. the special operations soldiers doesn't mean that they're not human. So all of the natural human reactions that come to any given stressful environment or, or stressful task accompany them where they are elite, where they are superior is in their reduced emotional sensitivity to those events. Mm-hmm. The amount of reps that they've taken to understand that any given thought or feeling isn't a rule that has to be followed or a law that has to be obeyed, that they don't have to surface prematurely just because their emotional response is, I hate this feeling, that they don't have to be married behind the sights of their weapon just because they're afraid of the threat on the other side of the door, that they can understand that they have to have their eyes completely open on an array in the entire room breach room, digest, process all of that information, be fully in the room, not behind their sights, identify the threat, and then the key point, trust what they're seeing and their ability to hold a fixation on that threat and align weapon system in sight and then execute. So all of those same emotions accompany them. The anxiety, the fear, the doubt, it's all there. It's just they've built, again, key word, they've built a tolerance to that stress to be able to metabolize that stress so that they can still perform within it. But it is not that they ever get to a point where they don't feel the stress, the anxiety, the pressure. It's still there. It's just... They've inoculated themselves in terms of sensitivity and allowing emotional stimulus to dictate behavioral response. So you've taught there the example you gave in a room and engaging in visual exploratory behaviors and taking in the detail, the information. You've spoken about the emotional side being there they're human beings are you striving to dampen down emotion in term in order to turn up the volume of cognitive prowess Mm -hmm. or are you striving to help them accept the emotion and still retain their cognitive prowess or is it more on an individual level no i i think 
globally, it's the latter. It's turning up the volume for a task-directed focus, regardless of what the uh, cognitive effective stimulus is. Because if we think about it on an acceptance, commitment, mindfulness, acceptance yep. framework, I don't need to turn down the volume on an unwanted thought or an unwanted feeling and then turn up the volume on my tax, task execution. It is that that volume of thought and feeling can be wherever it needs to be. And all I need to do is increase the volume, thus increase my attention management for the prescribed task, the behaviors associated with the execution of said task, and increasing the, the volume and the tone of my task execution, the expression of those task-related behaviors. It's not one or the other. It's that all of that noise is going to accompany you in performance. And I think that's when you know you're in a stress metabolism situation. So that's interesting. So what I'm hearing you say there is I can have affective. So feeling affective noise, I can have emotional noise, I can have cognitive noise in terms of thought noise. That, that can be there. But to this, this, the, there's therefore two things potentially going on here that you're helping them pay attention to their attention. And obviously there's the task. So are you just helping them pay attention to the task whilst all that noise is going on? Yes. Yep. So that's the paying attention to, to attention is getting them to pay attention yeah. to the task. But they're, they're in training mode. They might pay attention to what tasks, what specific tasks they've got to focus on. Absolutely. Yeah, that's the, that's the, the, the skill development that we're looking to really maximize yeah. is that ability for a task-directed focus yeah. amidst whatever psychological, environmental phenomenon might present itself. You know, you, you, you can walk into a room where you're met with strobe lights and fog or even hostility. That's going to produce any number of thoughts and emotions, thoughts and feelings. But ultimately, all that really matters is the individual we're looking for wears black shoes with white soles, is reported to have on an orange hoodie and a backwards blue cap. So admits that fog, admits that strobe light, admits that loud music, admits all those other hostile movement. That's all I'm looking for. There's a hoodie, a hat, and a certain pair of shoes. Go, do, execute. That's a task-directed focus. What do you, are there, th are there specific things that you do to train attention? Yeah, I think on, on the front end, it's having a very robust brief about the task okay, and about the prescribed conditions of that task. You know, these, in an ideal situation, these are the behaviors that we're looking for. This is what performance in this given evolution should look like. Spending some, again, robust time understanding what do we need to do behaviorally to shoot, move, communicate, to get a clean release off the line, to locate the football, watch it into the hands, right? It's being very profound in every detail of the execution so that in any given moment when other stimulus information presents itself, they have, if you will, a, a, a distraction from the task and tax execution to direct their cognitive and physical energy towards. So that's the first piece, is just having a very clear and explicit 
discussion about the task and the conditions and the standards. And then a, a live example would be, on, you know what an Aerodyne bike is? No, can you explain that? Yeah, it's um, basically a wind bike where the pedals are attached to a, a resistance fan, you know, that blows air back at you. And the levers are attached to the pedals so that while you're pedaling, you're also having to match a cadence with your upper body. Okay. It's a very low impact medium to get a pretty high uh, heartbeat. So in 35 to 40 seconds, I can have somebody go from 110 to 180 plus and then have them step off of that bike and then enter into this like tub of water that we have where they have to immerse themselves in the water with an elevated heart rate. So your breathing pattern is going to be right? Mm -hmm. So that when you then immediately put yourself underwater, what's the brain going to be? It's going to be on that cadence and it's going to demand a breath. And if you just give them no cues and no tactic whatsoever, their initial breath hold is going to be somewhere in the range of three to seven seconds. Now, take that same task and condition, but introduce a task of, I want you to decode this series of numbers with the letter in the alphabet that they correlate to. So you give them four, one, two, right? And then they go subsurface and they figure out that that's a D, an A, and a B. And they come up and they say dab, right? Or I want you to enter in and right before you take your breath hold and go subsurface, I'm going to give you a number. I want you to count backwards by seven. So they get on the bike, they enter into the tub, and now their mind is occupied amidst all of that physiological, psychological, physical stimulus. Their mind's occupied by 70, 63. 56, 49, 42, 35. Now all of a sudden, somebody that in the first iteration had a three-second breath hold has worked themselves up to 25 seconds. Why? Because they've given themselves something to direct away from the discomfort, to direct away from the pain, to direct away from the physiological accompaniment of pressure in the chest, beating of the heart, demand of the brain to breathe. Hmm. And you've occupied them with count backwards by seven or count backwards by five or four, one, two. And they have to occupy themselves and it gives them something to direct themselves towards. And all of a sudden the breath hold gets up to 20, 22, 25 seconds in a matter of three minutes. That's interesting. How does that translate into the field? Because task conditions brief. There's only so much information working memory can hold at any given moment. Mm -hmm. So this is an activity that's demonstrating to them that they can shift their attention away from the feelings of pain. And so subsequently, perform better on this task would this this would the combatants actually take this out into the field with them and mm -hmm. say count count down to be able to take their mind away from pain or are you just doing that to show them that they can actually do it and so subsequently when they're in the field they they do that and focus on the the brief the task correct okay yeah that it that it it's ultimately a introductory lived experience gotcha. to what task directed focus is yeah. that, you know, we aren't going to be able to choose the stressors and constraints that accompany us within performance, whether it's sport yeah. or tactical and that we are going to be inundated constantly with psycho physiological 
biological, social yep. stimulus. And that admits that we have a choice of what we give our attention to. And at any given time, as a performer, there will be a prescribed task that has identified behavioral expressions that, if optimized, result in the desired valued end. So admits that kind of dual input, we're taking reps at getting really efficient at directing ourselves towards again, that task directed focus, which is ultimately behavioral responses in line with task execution. That we don't have to get to a place where all of that stuff goes away, then we can perform. That we don't have the luxury of an if then relationship in these high performance domains. It has to be an and with. There's so many questions I can ask you about this, but I want to be respectful of your your time but i suppose listening to what you're saying and i've got all kinds of pictures going on in my mind of what this can look like and given that you're working in an environment where everything is essentially life and death um when you reflect back on your sports work you know because this is life and death in special forces in the army in the military you know i'm 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 guessing this is taken very seriously This is done over and over and over again. When you reflect back on your sports work, when you think of sports, do you think sports could do this better, could do this more comprehensively, could take this more seriously? This, you know, sports definitely, I mean, I think we talk about you can choose your attitude, effort and energy, but we don't necessarily demonstrate or or help participants develop their skills to be able to choose their attitude and energy as you know that that's something i want to say but this direction of attention do we spend enough time in sports helping players experience the ability to direct their attention i don't believe that we do in in my experience in my time in those spaces i feel like it has taken on too much of a lens of those that can do and those that can't don't as opposed to being very specific and acute in what we are trying to train psychologically and mentally and designing either a practice or elements of our practice to get that exact expression down. Yeah. Right. Uh, If you think about wrestling and at the elite level, collegiate and Olympic, how difficult it is to finish a leg attack. There are four, five, six different exchanges that occur off of a single given move. And that if you're not really good at chain wrestling, your likelihood of finishing a leg attack is pretty low. Okay, well, how often then do coaches build in free-flowing wrestling into their training sessions so that you get really good at going against somebody who gives you four or five consecutive different reactions to a movement where one movement leads to another movement, to another movement, and to another movement. If he does this, I do that. If she does this, I do that. And, and Very few coaches build that intentionally into their practice in in terms of architecting that type of not just motivational climate, but also skill development. So whether we're talking psychologically or physically, I think that's a space where we can, need, and should do better. And it presents a really powerful intersection between the sport and performance psychologist or specialist and a coaching staff. Brilliant. Brilliant. Well said. 
Brandon, I can't thank you enough for this conversation. It's been it's been awesome. It's uh, really got me thinking. Um, yeah. It's kind of got me uh, motivated to, to, to yeah. go out and speak to people tomorrow about come on, we got to do more because yeah. it's so easy, so easy to let that slide. It, it's I could just think of so many opportunities on a training pitch at practice where we should be doing this more. You know, yeah. it, I, I've heard a group of researchers talk about being a, a cognitive apprentice, mm-hmm. and we're not giving players the opportunity to have cognitive apprenticeships. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, if you think about the difficulty from a very pedestrian standpoint, as I look at your sport of of football, uh, mm-hmm. American version soccer, yeah. how do you train somebody to see the way the defenders are going to move, the way the passing lane is going to open, and then execute a proper pass accurately within that lane to meet your teammate that's moving from one spot to that space. That to me would be something where you, you, you take that idea of an aerodyne and a breath tank and you actively build yeah. and engineer parts of your practice that specifically hone in on that desired skill. Well, I, I think to answer that briefly, I think what can tend to happen, and look, there's, there's some absolute masters at, at coaching this side of the game, the, 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 the cognitive intelligence, the anticipation, the decision-making, the visual exploratory behaviours. There's some great people in this field, including Dr. Guy Draudet, who's been on the Sports Psych Show, um, sports psychologist at Norwegian Institute of Sport, who's probably the world leader at this, and um, and, and, and for me, po- possibly historically, where I feel it's not been done so well is coaches will set up good practices, for example, um, but they might um, instruct uh, or they might tell a, well, yeah, they might instruct, they might tell a player what to do, um, or they might think that the activity itself is just going to allow the player to absorb the information and so subsequently they learn. And, and those can help there's no question yeah. about that um however i i and i've worked on this with a few coaches um in the past is actually divergent questions just asking players you know what were you looking at there what did you see there what should you be looking at there not and by divergent i mean you don't have an answer yourself because it's in the player's world you know, what did you see there that made you make that decision there? What can you be looking at instead that might make you, um, uh, that might force you to make a different decision or, or you know, just, just asking questions, divergent questions, divergent being, I don't have an answer, but just questions around visual exploratory behaviors that end up in the kind of uh, anticipatory decisions that players make. And helping them become a student of their own decision making in those moments, and so subsequently helping them become critical thinkers of their own game, their own anticipation, their decision making, their intelligence, their game. I think that that's that's crucial. Um, those are the kind of things going through my mind as you as as, as you spoke there. But again, yeah. it's cognition in in team yeah. invasion sports. That cognition is anticipation decision making it's perception it's action it's it's those perceptual motor perceptual skills so yeah yeah and there's that really critical piece that i i'm sure you've seen it where in that debrief we have two options you know we can be coach centered and ambiguous or we can be coach centered and specific or we can be athlete-centered and ambiguous, athlete-centered and specific. And that that's really the question from a performance enhancement mm-hmm. standpoint in that type of cognitive space. Like, it would be best that our feedback and our instruction as coaches be athlete-centered. Mm-hmm. What did you see? What did you feel in terms of your execution? and being very specific in terms of what you as a coach saw, what they saw, 
and then obviously looking at, at the intersection between those two with a very specific language around what was deficient and what behaviorally would lead to them being more proficient in that. And I, I, I think you would agree like, way too often it's coach centered. He moved here. You should have yep. done that. Do that. Right. No. And it's not specific enough. It's, 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 co- it can, can be, it can yeah. be coach centered, which, you know, can, can offer, um, can provide benefits, but if it's athlete centered, if it's specific, it's, it's garnering specific information from the player related to anticipation, decision making. Yeah. Interesting stuff. Yeah. Interesting stuff. I mean, they're the expert, right? The athlete's the expert in their performance. Well, the athlete knows what they see, and, and yeah. only they only they can know what they see. Um, you know, there's only so much that they can look at. So, so we as a coach, a coach can make suggestions. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, it can be a co-creation here. Yeah. But yes, um, actually garnering the information about what is the player actually looking at here, you know, and and and, and thinking and considering can be important information to collect in order to build the efficacy of your coaching of of what you want to coach of the instructions that you want to explicitly coach. So, yeah. Okay. Fantastic. Um, well, I could probably stay on here another hour and, and and go deeper into, into that side of, of of cognition. Um, and we must do this again, uh, some other time. Um, I know you are on social social media. I mean, you're working full time in your position, but um, people can follow you. I don't know if you do Twitter, but you're on LinkedIn. Um, is there any sort of social media handles people can put in to, to follow you and your work? Yeah, just uh, obviously on, on LinkedIn, um, Brandon Orr PhD, and then on Instagram at Dr. Brandon Orr. And those are the only two that I uh, really uh, in, engage with and I tend to be most active on LinkedIn. I don't do a whole lot with, with Instagram other than to post like, Hey, I put an article on LinkedIn or Hey, I was a guest on, you know, this podcast and then posting the link there. But uh, most of my activity is centered on LinkedIn. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. Thank you very much, sir. That was, that was really fascinating. Uh, Dr. Brandon, all thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. It's been an honor. Appreciate the opportunity to share the space with you. Well, everybody, I really enjoyed that podcast and I'd love to hear what you, the listener, think. So please do get in touch via Twitter or Facebook or through my website, danabrahams.com to let me know what you think of the Sports Site Show. And if you do have any suggestions, I'd be delighted to hear them. I'm already looking forward to next week's episode. Bye for now.